jointly organized by Kerala State Science and Technology University, Astro Kerala and the Science Society. At the outset, I would like to thank you for the overwhelming response we got for this program. We have only 200 uh, seats here, but restrictions when we closed more than 350, we had to close down the registration sites. So, I am sorry to inform you that we couldn't accommodate uh, many people to register. I think but we have a uh, record of this program, so it will be made available on YouTube. Uh, we will now start the program. Uh, for the welcome address, uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Sridhar, he is the Secretary of uh, Astro Kerala. Sridhar. Good evening, all. As a general session, we have gathered here for this fantastic lecture, which we have been longing for some days now. And recently, we have seen a twist in the uh, behavior of people in the world. Past days, we, we were very difficult to have a house full of people. And nowadays, constantly, we are having a house full of people for, uh, coming here for public lectures. And especially, uh, it's been a great honor to have me having here. Anyway, uh, in uh, past few years, we have seen several detection of exoplanets. Thousands and thousands of exoplanets are being detected every day. And maybe there are millions and millions yet to be detected. And there is a very large possibility, therefore, for having an exo uh, life in some places. And today we are going to have a discussion and a different perspective of life in, uh, in Earth itself and in other places. And for that we have uh, Dr. Henry Troop here. And I, I am listening to welcome you all here. And I welcome Dr. Rajiv. Rajiv Titi. Uh, he is Associate Professor of the Department of Avionics in IASD. Uh, he is here to be presenting the section. Next time you will come our very special guest and speaker, Dr. Henry Thru. He is senior scientist in planetary science institution and is a member of uh, Team NASA's New Horizon mission. Welcome you. Uh, I welcome Dr. Ayana Ayana. He is associate professor in the Department of Earth and Space Science at ESD. And he is a key person to have this lecture in here recently. Apart from that, we have uh, many eminent persons in here. Radha Shansar is there, and several such persons are here. I welcome you all. Uh, and above all, the life of every lecture is the audience. And as Rajas uh, have mentioned, more than, uh, more than 50 people have registered, and there are only few people attend. I welcome you all for the event. Uh, inauguration of this program, uh, request uh, Sri Adul Jalal Prakash sir, is the director of this party over here. I'm Dr. Henry Thru, uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, Dr. Anand Narayan, Sri Sridhar, uh, the professors, scientists, students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. As Shreela has told, actually, I am really happy to see that Puru Samanaha filled with the, the proper audience, an audience with the curiosity and interest, actually. So it's a very, really happy and uh, good evening for me as far as I am concerned as the director of the institution. And I don't want to take much time. We are all interest, eager, interested and eager in hearing the talk of Dr. Henry He has come all along the news. And, uh, and scientist of NASA, and uh, he will be introduced by Dr. Rajiv. So, with these few words, let me inform it is inaugurated. Thank you, sir, for formally inaugurating this uh, program. Uh, now, we have uh, we start the uh, public lecture on astrobiology title, uh, uh, the Lord in the Universe. But before that, for introducing the speaker to the audience, uh, I invite Dr. Anand Narayan, he is Associate Professor in the Department of Earth and Space Science in the National Space Science and Technology Trial. Good evening everyone. Welcome to what promises. 
finds us to be a very interesting evening. So um, my role is to just read out a few things about Henry Group. Henry is a senior scientist with the Planetary Science Institute in US. He received his PhD in Planetary Science from the University of Colorado, which is also in the US, in 2000. And since then he has been working on various projects, mostly for uh, the US Space Agency. Um, while working at NASA, he managed two of the prestigious one, the New Horizons mission, which was the mission which was launched in 2006, and after a 10-year long journey, my 10-year long journey, it reached uh, Pluto in 2015. So he played a very key role. He was part of the science of this New Horizons mission. And uh, his interest, his research, in, he's a planetary scientist. He's also interested in astrobiology, some big questions like uh, how did life on Earth uh, emerge? Could there be life elsewhere in the universe? How do, exert, how do extrasolar planets evolve? Um, yeah, so all, the, all these very interesting questions are part of his research. And uh, another dimension to his uh, work is that he has been very actively involved in education and public outreach. So he has spent a number of years in Africa where he has helped uh, schools there to develop their science programs. He has given a lot of lectures in Mexico, in US, and uh, for the last uh, two and a half years, he has been uh, at Mumbai in India. And where uh, in these two and a half years, he has lectured in many schools and colleges here in India. He has taught for a while at the St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. He was still teaching. Still teaching at the St. Xavier's College in Mumbai. And the other interesting thing is that in these two and a half years, he has travelled from Rajasthan to Assam and from Himalayas to Kerala. So he has probably seen more of India than most of us. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but it's, it uh, speaks about his passion for education and public outreach. And for all the education and public outreach work that he has done, in 2017 he was awarded the Carl Sagan Medal by the American Astronomical Society. <laughs> his work in science communication and outreach to the public. So with that, let me invite Henry Group for uh, his lecture on Are We Alone in This? Thank you so much. It's such a, such a pleasure to be here. And, uh, so excited to be here at this, uh, at this site where so much of, of the history of astronomy in India has, has begun uh, with, the, with the early rocket launches and, uh, and everything which is happening today with Israel. So, Thank you so much for, for having me here. So I'm going to talk about astrobiology and uh, some of the work I'm doing in it, some of the big questions that we're trying to answer, and, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So when, uh, when people hear that I'm an astronomer, they um, uh, People, when people hear that I'm an astronomer, they ask me one question, do I think that aliens exist? And uh, you know, in other words, do I think that there is life elsewhere, outside of us, in the universe? How many people, raise your hand if you think aliens, life exists outside of the Earth? Good, 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 good. Raise your hand if, like, if you think life does not exist outside of the Earth. Good, good, good. You know, that's the thing. We don't know yet. And so you can, all of you can justify your answers properly. I'm going to show you, tell you about this, and I'll tell you why I answer it this way. Um, which is if you look at the total number of stars in our galaxy, we have 100 billion stars in our galaxy. That's a, that's a uh, ten, one with 22 zeros after. We have 100 billion galaxies. Uh, you multiply those together, one with 22 zeros. And there's 22 stars in the, uh, in the universe. And I think at least one star probably more kind of planet with life. That's <coughs> such a huge number of stars. Um, however, not the question, do I think life is out there, but the question, have we ever actually detected life? The question, have we ever detected life? Uh, and the answer is no. We keep looking for life elsewhere. We keep looking for, whether you call it aliens or whether you call it <coughs> um, biosignatures or, or uh, whatever. We have, we've looked for life lots of different places. We keep looking for life on the planets, on Mars, on asteroids. We keep looking for radio signals. And over and over again, we found nothing. So as far as we can tell, 
there's middle life which has been inside of what you know where where we're looking for it. And so this is sort of a conflict with the question of whether I think life is out there or not. Um, so this is a big question. In fact, if you think about it, this is one of the big questions that astronomers and philosophers and scientists are really trying to answer. And the big questions are we alone? Um, and you can break that down into three smaller questions. Is our solar system unique? Is the Earth unique? And is life on Earth unique? And these are the questions that I'm going to address. So let's step back in time. Let's go back to the 1500s, where we had the earliest models for the solar system, which were, which were starting to come out. And we had what was called the heliocentric model. Helio meaning the sun, center meaning what's at the center of the universe. And so we thought that the, um, the Earth was at the center of everything. I mean, this is not the heliocentric, I'm sorry, the geocentric model, meaning the Earth was at the center of everything. And everything else went around it. The sun went around it, and the moon went around it, and so on. And, uh, and of course we were special, of course we were unique, because we were at the center of everything. There was just one part of the universe, and we were it. So we were special, just us. Um, then in the, in the 1600s, after the astronomer Copernicus um, used, used uh, observations to show that the, that the uh, sun was at the center of the solar system and not the Earth, we had what was called the, the heliocentric model, where we have the sun right here, orbited by the planets. And suddenly, this is a huge shift in our philosophy. We are no longer at the center of everything. In fact, we're actually equal to some of these other planets here. Here we have Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. And these are the planets which we knew about at the time. And we are just one of these other planets orbiting the sun. And so, we are still pretty special, but it's just us here with the other planets as well. Then in the 1700s, astronomer Christian Huygens was the first to propose that if you look out and you look at all the stars out there, and uh, he proposed that each of those stars was a sun, just like our own sun. And if that's a sun, it might have planets going around it, just like the, just like the planets in our solar system. And so, in fact, rather than just being one solar system in the universe, he proposed there could be millions or billions of solar systems out there going around each of those stars that we can see. And so we're becoming less and less special here. Um, it's us plus the other planets plus a hundred billion other stars out there, maybe all of which are like us. Okay, you can see where we're going here. Uh, then in the 1930s, the, the uh, uh, American astronomer Edwin Hubble was the, was the uh, first one to propose that and, uh, and show that uh, these uh, spiral shaped things here, this is an actual image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope here. Um, these, uh, and all these spiral shaped things, right, almost everything on this picture, are not stars, but these are galaxies. And each of these galaxies has within it a hundred billion stars, just like our own Milky Way. If you were to see our Milky Way galaxy, it would look very similar to some of these other galaxies. And if each of these hundred billion galaxies, each has a hundred billion stars, uh, the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, and we are getting at the same time less and less special here with time. So this is kind of a history of, of, uh, of, of astronomy to make us feel less special with time. Uh, then in, the, in the, the last 25 years or so, people have started to find planets around many of these other stars. And here's, a, here's just cartoons of some of these planets. We see many stars that have one planet, or two planets, or three planets, or up to seven planets we've detected. I mean, Talk a little bit more, more about those later on. And uh, so each of these stars has 10 planets going around it. And we have 10 to the 23 other planets in the solar system, in the universe. And it's a huge place. And so we occupy just a tiny, insignificant corner of the universe. Our region is not particularly special or unique. There's billions of other planets around, billions of other stars in our galaxy. And many of these may be very similar to our own. And so, to these questions, is our solar system unique? It's probably not. Is the Earth unique? Probably not. We've never found anything which is exactly identical to the Earth, or exactly identical to the solar system. But we've only been in the business of looking for these for a couple of years, and so I think it's a matter of time. And is life on Earth unique? That's a really big question. We don't have an answer to that yet. Now, if we want to search for life through the solar system or through the universe, we need to know where to look. The universe is really big. There's a lot of places that life might be able to live, but there's probably some other places that life is not going to live. Like, do we really need to search on 
planets which are made of hot molten lava. And that's all they have there is molten lava. Do we need to search in the middle of black holes? Do we need to search in the center of the galaxy where the gravitational fields, magnetic fields, and the charged particle fields are so intense um, that it destroys everything? Um, there's some, re some, some of these places, probably not, um, because chemistry is what makes up life. And chemistry can't happen in, uh, in all these different sorts of environments. We can't, you know, if you're very, very hot, if you're, if you're in, a, in a star at tens of thousands of degrees, chemistry can't happen there because the star is so hot that it breaks apart all of the molecules, it breaks apart the atoms and ionizes them. And you don't have chemistry. Life is complex chemistry. So we could probably eliminate some of these places as being, uh, as being good places to look for life. So let's make a list of the sorts of places where we do want to search for life. What environmental requirements are there for life on Earth? And so if you talk to biologists about 20 years ago and you ask them, like, hey, I want to look for some life. Where should I look? What requirements are there for life? And they might come up with a list like this. It says, OK, well, you can't be too hot, you know, because obviously if it's boiling, you can't have life, because that's going to be too much, too much heat, destroys the cell walls, and breaks things apart. So you can't be too cold because you have to have enough energy to survive more than zero, less than 100. Your acidity can't be too high because that's going to break apart the cell walls. Not too salty because that plays havoc with the chemical reactions. You don't want to be too high pressure. Uh, maybe not have radiation or ultraviolet light which is going to come in and destroy things and change the chemistry. All the life we know of is based on carbon, hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Liquid water is a good thing. So a biologist might come up with a list like this. So let's go through this list. Um, here's a picture. This is a kind of looks like a like a like a like a puzzle here. I'll show you what it is. Um, uh, this is taken from the air. This is a a, a walkway actually, a, and this is a park bench. So these are people. This is in the, uh, the Yellowstone National Park in the United States. And uh, so this is hot water here, and what's running off of here looks like uh, looks like lava. This is actually bacteria. This is water which is uh, water infested with bacteria and ooze and gunk and algae and stuff like this. And what's crazy about this bacteria is it loves hot temperatures. It's called thermophilic. It loves temperatures which are almost to the to, uh, to boiling, about 95 Celsius. Now we think of temperatures like this as being really really bad because if you and I jumped in this water, it would kill us because our chemistry isn't adjusted these. These bacteria here, we call them thermophilic because they love these hot temperatures. Uh, you can call these things extremophiles because these bacteria, they, love it. they live in extreme temperatures compared with us. They would look at us and call us extremophiles because we live in these extremely dry and cold terrains compared with them. If you go to the, uh, the bottom of the ocean, you can see bacteria which also live at very, very high temperatures and high pressures. Uh, these bacteria here actually live at um, about 120 Celsius. Uh, you might think, how can you be at 120 Celsius in the liquid water? Uh, that's because these are high pressure as well, so, so uh, that's okay. And so you see these, uh, you see these bacteria thriving in these very hot, dense environments. Okay, so we can cross off this requirement that about temperature is being a good requirement for life. Let's look at things that are too cold. Well, historically, people have thought that. That in order to uh, have bacteria survive, you want to be at a, at a moderate temperature, not too cold. But here, if you go to Antarctica, you can actually find bacteria which are living and thriving and reproducing and, and uh, consuming energy and everything in, in, uh, in ice that's down as low as like 20 or 30 degrees below zero. And here's someone drilling for these bacteria right there. So we can cross that off our list. Because bacteria, because bacteria we keep finding in everywhere. Life uh, life thrives, life expands to live wherever we put it, wherever it puts itself. Uh, this is the mine runoff from a, from a mine in, um, in Spain, it's a Rio Tinto mine. And it kind of looks like those, uh, those images from Yellowstone. And uh, all this here kind of looks like you know, dirty mine runoff water. Uh, this is, it's, uh, it's, it's leached a lot of the minerals out of the, out of the rocks here. And uh, the acidity has gone way up, so the pH is going down. So this has a pH of less than two. So this is the sort of thing that would really blister your skin if you touched it. It's not good for life, right? Because it steals all the hydrogen atoms there. Um, turns out that a lot of what you're seeing here is actually bacteria. This bacteria which loves living in this extreme, highly acidic environment. So once again, 
in these extreme environments, wherever we put it, wherever we want to run around, some, some, kind, of, some kind of life loves to live there. Um, not too salty. We think of salt as being bad because it changes the chemical balance and changes, restricts uh, how, uh, how ions can move in, in chemical reactions. And uh, we've got the salt taste areas on Earth. This is the salt pans in Botswana, Africa. And uh, this is all dried out right now. Um, it's all dried out right now, but if you go there um, during the during the, uh, the monsoon months, it gets very wet, and uh, and you have an extremely salty water there. The first thing that happens when this uh, water gets salty is the bacteria comes back to life or revives itself and starts taking over. So these are bacteria that love being in the sort of saltiest environments on Earth. And we can see where we're going here. You can find creatures that love living at the bottom of the ocean under many, many uh, uh, times the atmospheric pressure, a thousand times the atmospheric pressure. Uh, you can find bacteria that love living in nuclear reactors and love UV light. You can find bacteria or uh, life which is, which is based around other chemicals or doesn't use oxygen. And what about this last one here? It must have liquid water. Turns out, that we've never found any exception to this last one here. So as far as we can tell, every form of life on Earth requires liquid water. So the search for life is largely the search for liquid water. So here's a key that we can, that we can look for. We're looking for life, let's just look for liquid water. So the solar system is close. We're in the solar system. This is the best place to start looking. Let's, um, let's, uh, let's go through and, and see where we should look for liquid water. And Let's not get ahead of ourselves, too, thinking about our biases. Like, why do we want to look, look for liquid water? I mean, maybe we're just being too biased here. Um, and uh, you know, what other kinds of chemistries could we, could we look for, too? Life is basically complex chemistry. It's complex chemistry which reproduces. And it's the most complex chemistry that we know. It's far more complex than any other chemistry that we know. Um, most chemistry happens fastest in liquids. What does happen fast in liquids? Because liquids move things around. There's not much chemistry that happens in this solid table, because this table is solid. It's just sitting there. All the molecules are kind of locked there, and they can't move. <coughs> and there's not a lot of chemistry that happens in the air, because the air molecules are too far apart. They don't interact with each other very often. But with liquids, that's why, we're, that's why in chemistry class, you normally know, pour liquids together, because that's where the action is. It's in liquids. And so if we're looking for complex chemistry, we probably want to look for liquids. Is liquid water the best thing to look for? Who knows? But water has some unique properties here. So over here, this is a, just a little chart that I made that, that lists the, uh, the abundance of, uh, of each element um, versus the number of the element here. So um, you don't need to read all these, but just read up the top here. This shows hydrogen is the most abundant element in the whole universe. So there's a lot more hydrogen than anything else. Next after hydrogen is helium. Helium doesn't really count because it's um, nothing. If you remember back from chemistry class, almost nothing does any chemistry with helium. Helium is very isolation. It likes itself and nothing else. So chemistry doesn't happen with helium. Um, but right after helium comes oxygen. So oxygen is the second most abundant uh, <coughs> atom which does any chemistry with anything. And so if you take those two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, you put them together, that makes water. <coughs> So we would expect there to be water all over the universe. And it is. We, we, could, we find water over, all over the solar system. We find water in the most distant galaxies that we can see. We can see water in the most distant planets and comets that we can see. So water's all over the place. And that makes sense because hydrogen and oxygen are all over the place. And there's no other liquids which are, which are like that. Now, oftentimes when we see water, it's not as a liquid. It's often frozen in the solid in ice, or it's in, liquid, it's in water vapor. But if you put it at the right temperature and the right pressure, you can make it into water. So let's search through the solar system and let's see where we should look for liquid water. So we have three good places to look for liquid water. Let me just go through them. So this is a picture from Mars. This is a nice black and white picture. It's black and white because it was old. This was taken by the uh, NASA's Viking Orbiter in 1976, 1977. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is about maybe 50 kilometers across from side to side. And you can see these drainage channels. And these drainage channels look just kind of like what you might see in the, in the, uh, in the, in the deserts in Rajasthan. That you, have a, you have a lot of water that comes in here, and then it just washes out into a valley. 
I can have a, a dry areas over here, and then everything feeds into this into this channel. And we saw this. Astronomers saw this, and they instantly concluded, like Mars. It was very obvious that Mars used to have large oceans. Uh, and uh, it wasn't clear where they went. We now know that they they because uh, Mars is not wet now, but it has the, all these all this evidence that it used to have many many oceans worth of water. And uh, turns out that the water could have either frozen into the tundra, or it could have evaporated off of space. It looks like it evaporated off of space, it's very too. But Mars does not have that water now. Um, there's a little, a little bit of evidence that Mars might have a little bit of water left on it. Like occasionally we see little, uh, little maybe rivulets or outbursts where water has fallen down. You can't really prove very easily that these are water, because it might be, uh, you know, it might be just a rock sliding down. It might be some other liquid in there that's caused cause something to flow down, but there's some evidence that it might be liquid water. There might be a little bit of liquid water left on the surface of Mars. Um, the, there's a little bit of evidence that uh, there's this one rock here. It's about the size of a potato, about a kilogram, and it was found on Antarctica uh, back in 1984, and astronomers after that uh, were examining it, and they showed that it came from Mars. And you can do that by looking at the chemistry. It was an asteroid that hit Mars and landed later on the Earth. And uh, under a microscope, it's it's revealed a couple of features that look a little bit like uh, a little bit like fossilized bacteria would on the Earth. Um, the color has been added here; they're not really green. We don't know whether this is life or not. It's certainly uh, dead life if it is life. It's probably just a uh, like a, some sort of crystal formation, which would be possible there. But uh, but uh, so that's the that's the closest we've ever found to finding anything resembling life from Mars. Now we keep. Sending spacecraft to Mars, we've sent a lot of spacecraft to Mars. This is the NASA's uh, Curiosity rover, and it's currently exploring Mars' surface. And it's not really designed to look for life itself, but it's designed to get the whole picture of life, put um, get the history of habitability um, across Mars. And so it has about a dozen instruments on board, which are measuring the surface composition, measuring the uh, measuring the composition of the, of the rocks, uh, looking for clues. Um, such as the, uh, uh, the specific chemical signatures from different uh, from different species on the ground and so forth, to see how wet Mars was and when the water was there and where it went and what its chemistry was like and so forth. Okay, so that's Mars, number one place. Number two, Saturn, Moon, Enceladus. Enceladus is a is a moon going around Saturn. It's about the size of the Earth, more or less. And uh, what's exciting about it? This is a this is an actual photo of Enceladus. And, you can see the moon here, and you can see all these geysers coming off the side here, just like that. And these geysers are shooting water into the air. Now, if you just take an ice cube and you crush it and you squeeze it, nothing happens to it. If you want to shoot a geyser off, you have to have liquid water. And so that must mean there's liquid water below the surface on Enceladus. Now, Enceladus is a small moon, and it's pretty far from Saturn and pretty far from the Sun, so we don't know how it would be. You would expect everything out there to be cold and frozen like an ice cube. We don't know quite how Enceladus is keeping all this water warm, but somehow it is. So somehow there's a reservoir of liquid water below the surface on, on Enceladus. And uh, uh, maybe, you know, maybe it looks something like this, where you have a, uh, uh, where you have like an ocean of water that is covered up by an icy shell, or maybe a little patch of, of like a lake, a lake of, of uh, hot water below the surface, which is covered up. So um, NASA had a spacecraft called Cassini. Cassini was in the news about uh, six months ago because it uh, eventually got to the end of its mission and, and was uh, flown intentionally into Saturn itself. The reason it was flown into Saturn is actually to protect Enceladus because we didn't want any of the bacteria, the stray bacteria, which had accidentally got on board, the, the uh, jumped along with the ride on. On Cassini, we didn't want to potentially contaminate Enceladus if, uh, if in fact, uh, there was, there was a, uh, Enceladus was, was habitable. Uh, okay, so that's number two, Enceladus. And the third place that search for uh, liquid water and search for life is uh, Jupiter's moon Europa. And so over here on the right hand side, um, you can see these things. And these are these are uh, these are are uh, icebergs which are floating on the surface of Europa. And each of these icebergs here are maybe a kilometer across or so. And you can see where they've, uh, you know, this one used to be down here, and they just float around the surface. Now they're not floating on the surface right now. Right now, um, you know, all of this water here is frozen, but you can see that recently 
these things were floating around there on the surface, and they, and they moved around. It's kind of like the ice, uh, you know, around the uh, around the North Pole or around the South Pole. That every every year, it kind of occasionally freezes over and then thaws. And so, by reason on Jupiter, maybe in the last million years or so, then this thing was uh, was uh, was liquid on the surface. Um, and certainly, if it's liquid on the surface, it was liquid on the surface there now. It probably also has a lot of a big ocean of water below the surface. So maybe something like this is what Enceladus and Europa both look like, where you have an ocean of water below and then a thin layer of ice uh, hanging out in space. So Europa is really exciting. Uh, both Europe and NASA are sending missions to Europa. They're going to be launched in the next decade or so. Um, and they're uh, they're searching for the history of habitability on Europa, and trying to see how deep are those oceans? Where are those oceans? What's powering those oceans? Have they been there for the age of the solar system? Because if life has had four and a half billion years to evolve on the Earth, and it's had four and a half billion years to evolve on Europa or Enceladus, maybe there's some sim similarities in the chemistry that we what we end up with on those planets, as here, those bodies. <coughs> okay, so those are our top three places. Um, to look for life, in my opinion, in the solar system. Uh, there's some, several other places, like, like uh, Saturn's moon Titan, that are often, often considered as well. Um, what about life beyond the solar system? I mean, the solar system is pretty big, but what about beyond that? So, uh, one of the missions that I'm involved with is the New Horizons mission. It's the NASA mission which uh, uh, went out to Pluto. It took us 10 years to get out to Pluto. Uh, Pluto is about 6 billion kilometers away. But, Pluto's not the edge of the solar system. Pluto is much, much less than 1% of the way to the next star. And uh, going at the speed that our spacecraft was going, it's the fastest spacecraft that's ever been launched, and it's going 36 kilometers, 36,000 kilometers an hour, and it'll be about 50,000 years until we even make it to the next star, to Alpha Centauri, to observe that. So at this speed, it's hopeless to even consider sending a spacecraft out to the next star to physically investigate life there. So if we're going to physically investigate, physically search for life. Uh, we have to do it in our solar system, because it's not practical right now to send a spacecraft like these spacecraft that we have to another planet, or to another solar system. There is work which is done with the SETI program. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And this is a radio program which analyzes radio signals from thousands of telescopes across the, across the Earth. And uh, it process the, processes these to listen for intelligent radio signals that would be be transmitted from another, uh, another civilization, either intentionally or unintentionally, that we can pick up. So we can listen to those. We can detect planets around many distant stars, and we can guess at their suitability for life. So uh, these exoplanets, they're called, because these are planets around other stars, not around. These exoplanets are too far away and too small for us to physically you know, take a picture of them with a camera or with a telescope. Uh, but we can but we can detect them by their motions around this uh, uh, that they cause in the star and some other methods. Um, so if we study these exoplanets and we can we, and we can look at these planets and we can say, hey, there's a planet right here and it's not too close to its star. You know, it's like it's too close to its star, it'll be too hot. If it's too far away from its star, it'll be too cold. But what about if we find a planet which is right in that middle? Uh, there might be a perfect planet where liquid water would be stable, and it might give you a candidate for life. Now, at this point, these planets are too far away to study in more in depth, but you can bet that we're interested in studying them and finding out how many of them might be in the right temperature to support liquid water. So the Mars Curiosity rover is uh, this spacecraft here. Um, it's sitting on the surface of Mars right now. It's driving around. It uh, launched in, in uh, 2011. Landed in 2012 into a into a crater on Mars, and uh, um, it has a bunch of instruments on it which are searching for the history of habitability on Mars. So I have a I have a just a short video here about how we got this thing to Mars, and uh, and then I'll tell you a little, little about what it's doing on the same thing. <laughs>
and still looks crazy. We'll top the atmosphere. Down to the surface. It takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive and dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry descent landing, also known as EDL, can refer to as a seven minutes of terror. Because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars. Going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. This landing into the atmosphere develops so much aerodynamic drag out of each year. It's not going to be low, it's like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down the final entry through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about a thousand miles an hour. So, at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. It's up that fast. It's a neck snapping nine shoes. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it only slows down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So, we have no choice, we better pay off and come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something. We're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So, the first thing we do is make this really radical endeavor. Fly off to the sun. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity. Getting the rover moving straight up and down so we can look at the surface with its radar. See where we're going to land, and we'll get straight down to the bottom of the crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those right in with two curves to come because if we were to descend impulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud, a dust cloud that they'd go and land on the road with damaged mechanisms and damaged instruments. So, the way we solve that problem is by using the sky ring. 20 meters above the surface, you have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its feet, on the surface. As the rover touches down, it's now on the ground. In the same state, it's in a collision force with the rover. You must cut the bridle immediately and fight in the same state to a safe distance from the rover. That was five years ago. The spacecraft uh, got there successfully, of course, and it's, um, and it's uh, driving around the surface of Mars every day. So here's what it's up to. It's been there for, uh, we count Martian days. Martian day is about, uh, it's about 15 minutes different than, a, than the 24-hour day on the Earth, so we call it a soul. It's been driving for 1,934 Martian days. 
and this is put about 20 kilometers from where it started. And so it's, it's in this crater, it's a giant crater. And so, you know, marked here, just the beginning of its path in, uh, in days, 41, 43, you know, and so on. Here's the, here's the area of this crater that's uh, driving, which is <clears throat> maybe 100 kilometers across. This job is just to explore the history of water on Mars. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, the <clears throat> this Dale crater that's in is um, very similar to a well-known crater, which is in Maharashtra. How many people have been out to the Lonar crater in Maharashtra? Anybody been there? Well, I'll take you all there then. <laughs> Man, um, we should just get on a bus and go there right now. Because it, it's, uh, you can fly to Rungabad. It's about two hours from Rungabad. And uh, this, this uh, crater is about, uh, it's about uh, three kilometers across. And um, it's, uh, it was made by an asteroid which slammed into the, slammed into the, the uh, desert from Maharashtra there about five million years ago. And what's really neat about this, we, you know, we see craters like this in a couple hundred places across the Earth. But the Lono Crater is, is really unique, and that's because it's the only one which is into basalt. Basalt is, uh, is what's made by volcanoes, so this is on the Deccan Plateau. It's all volcanic rock. And it turns out that Mars is all volcanic. Uh, we see lots of volcanoes on Mars. So Mars is based, mostly made of basalt as well. And so um, this is the only one on Earth. So this is a very good analog for um, both the composition of the crater, because it's, it's an impact crater into basalt. And it's in what's called a hydrothermal system, because there's a lot of water in this thing. And if you look at the craters on Mars, there was a lot of water in them two billion years ago, three billion years ago as well. So this is, this is a well-studied crater on Earth. There's many scientists, including some of my colleagues and many uh, uh, scientists from India, who regularly go up the lunar crater to study its shape and its chemistry and its morphology and so forth, um, because it's such an excellent analog to the craters on Mars. And so this Gale crater on Mars, what it's looking like. So you had a crater. This is older. This is four billion years ago. This crater was put on, put down on Mars. And uh, you have a, you have an impact crater. So an asteroid similarly slammed into the surface of Mars, excavated this big hole. And then just like just like you get in the, in the lake here, you know, you walk to the bottom of the lake and you put your hand in there, and it's all muck, right? That you dig up, and it's all a mess. Um, and that's because everything interesting falls down and it gets washed into the lake. Well, that's great. That's what we're looking for. If we're looking for the history of water on Mars, the history of stuff on Mars. We want to go to the bottom of the lake where everything is washed down there because that's where the most interesting stuff is bound to be found. So, uh, so you, have this big, you have this big lake there. Everything gets washed down there. It gets sedimented around and so forth. And, uh, and that's four billion years ago. Right now, it's all just remains and it's dry. And, uh, and we have our, our little uh, rover here, and it's just driving slowly up the edge of this crater, and it's poking through all these different layers of stuff which has been deposited out around there over the past billions of years. And so the more it looks around there, the more parts of history it can, it can do. And as, it goes higher, uh, as it goes higher along these walls, it's seeing more and more recent times, just like climbing through the geological layers on it, like a geologist would. Um, the sorts of things that it sees here, you can see here, uh, right here. This is, uh, this is from uh, the end of last year, um, where uh, these are these are mud cracks. And this is just a photo. It's like a photo that you would snap with your with your smartphone, and you can see the mud cracks right here. This is dust. This is the dust which is blown off from uh, from, from Mars. And, uh, mud cracks. Where this is just where one afternoon it was kind of wet, and then it dried out, and then uh, something came. That, you know, when it dried out, that caused these, this mud to crack. So this is just one warm afternoon on Mars from two billion years ago, and we're seeing the evidence of that now in these mud cracks. So this is sort of day-to-day -day stuff in the history of Mars that we're looking for with the, with the Mars Curiosity rover. Now, I was so excited to see this for the first time. You know, so this is at the end of well, at the end of 2016, and uh, I was just outside of the BT station in Bombay, and, uh, and I saw someone in the street, and um, of course, I and everybody else had no money then, right? Um, and uh, someone's like holding around a 2000. Of course, I was really excited to see his, to see his 2000, um, but I was really excited to see the back of it, because it had this beautiful Indian Mars rover, Mars, uh, Mars orbiter mission on the back of it. So, uh, um, man, what, a, what, an amazing, uh, what an amazing tribute to this amazing mission, which, Mar which, uh, which Indians flown there. So, um, no, uh, this is the uh, um, yeah, very much complimentary 
to missions which are, have been set up by the U.S. and Europe and, uh, and, and other, uh, Japan and other agencies up to Mars. So uh, the Mars Rover mission launched in 2013. Uh, it takes, it takes about nine months to get to Mars. And so it successfully went in orbit around Mars in September 2014. And its goal is basically to, to uh, it has a number of science instruments on it, but the, um, two of the big goals are to, uh, to image the surface and to search for methane. So imaging the surface, there's a, a, a camera, it's basically the same as the camera on your smartphone, although a little bit, a little bit bigger and, and uh, better. Um, and then to search for methane. Methane is a uh, CH4, very common molecule on Earth. We see methane all over the place. And on Earth, methane is basically made by two different things. One is biology, so decay and digestion and so forth. And methane comes from us, methane comes from cows, from ants, from plants rotting, from everything. Um, so uh, everything related to life, at least. And the other thing that methane is caused by is volcanism. Volcanoes belch out a lot of methane in the atmosphere. Now, as far as we know, uh, Mars is pretty dead in both of these departments. There's no life that we know of on Mars, and there's no volcanism that we know of on Mars happening right now. There are dead volcanoes, but no, no, no living ones. And so, if a uh, Mars rover mission finds methane in the atmosphere of Mars, that's exciting because it means that if either one of these uh, are things that it finds, that would be really fantastic. So, uh, so that's the, that's the, the, the purpose of this, uh, this methane searching instrument on Mars. So, um, you know, results for that are still, still, uh, still coming in, nothing, de nothing detected yet, um, but uh, a really exciting thing that, uh, that India is contributing in the search for biology on Mars. This is a list that you can get from Wikipedia. Uh, it's really long, that's why it's so small, you can't read it. And this is a list of all the missions which have been set up to Mars. Um, uh, so this is uh, ordered by time. Red means it failed because we crashed into the planet or blew up or something like that. And uh, you know, green means uh, it succeeded. And so there's been 50-some uh, missions which have, which have gone to Mars. About half of those have succeeded. Um, and all these missions basically keep telling us the same thing. Uh, they don't give us any evidence that life is there on Mars right now or ever has had it in the past. Um, none of these missions come back with a positive result for life. Uh, and that's 24 successful missions on the surface of Mars. And so we can keep looking for life on Mars. But before we do so, we should look at the history of, you know, why is there no life on Mars right now that we can find? Um, so let's, you know, let's look at the history of Earth. So this is just a timeline here. And uh, the Earth was formed, all the planets in the solar system were formed about four and a half billion years ago. The Earth was formed here four and a half billion years ago. Um, it was bombarded by a lot of asteroids and comets for the first couple hundred million years, so that wouldn't be a good time if you were alive to be on the surface. Uh, but soon after that, about four billion years ago, three and a half, um, photos, uh, the, the Earth cooled down, we had oceans, and photosynthesis came in pretty quick. Bacteria, um, the, the atmosphere started having more oxygen in it, and uh, and eventually down here, at, uh, at uh, right about now, we start having larger animals, plants, and eventually humans. And so humans have only existed for the last tiny, tiny slice of this four and a half billion years on, on Earth. But life has existed for a long time. In fact, as soon as the Earth formed, as soon as the bombardment ended here, uh, life came out very, very quickly after that, maybe a couple hundred million years afterwards. It's all it took for life to establish itself. So let's look at the history of Mars here. <coughs> Mars formed at the same time, had the same heavy bombardment here, and it was wet for a little bit, but then the water disappeared about three and a half billion years ago. And since then, it's been dry and dead, dry and dead, dry and dead. And now we're looking for life on Mars, and we're surprised that we don't find it. Um, so it looks like, you, you know, if you compare these, it's pretty obvious that, that any life which might have existed on Mars. It was a long time ago, and a lot has happened since then. So, so the only life that we are likely to ever find on Mars is life which, which uh, developed and then uh, got killed off and has survived. You know, perhaps it's fossilized bacteria or something like that from billions and billions of years ago, three and a half billion years ago. It's very hard on Earth to find even a rock that's three and a half billion years ago. Uh, because plate tectonics and erosion and so forth. And a lot of those same processes are happening on Mars too, so it's very, very hard to find anything that old on Mars. 
Um, Marshall Leon has only had this brief window to host wine. He has never did, or any fossil record of it. He's basically washed away. So, on the other hand, we can look at um, we can look at these other places I want to talk about. Let's look at Enceladus. Let's look at Europa. Enceladus and Europa were formed in the same four and a half billion years ago. They had impacts, and then they're wet now. So they were wet back then. They've been wet and warm the whole time. Wet and warm is the best place to have chemistry. And if you're trying to evolve life, if you're trying to evolve anything complex, um, these look like fantastic places to go to. Uh, because they've been, they've been uh, viable places to host life for almost the whole, uh, just as long as the Earth has. So uh, let's go to Europa, let's go to Enceladus, well, let's find some life there. We don't know what's going to be there, you know, maybe it's whales, uh, whales and, uh, and, and dolphins below the surface. Uh, could be very different than what we have here, but uh, but it's definitely the, 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 the place that we need to go to search for life. Beyond this, it's going to take us 50,000 years to be the next star, um, and telescopes, we can do telescopic searches well beyond that uh, at uh, long distances. I want to just finish up by, um, by showing you a little bit about some of these telescopic searches, and in particular one uh, telescopic search, which has yielded some really interesting results just in the last year. Um, and so, if you if you uh, use a telescope and you look at a field of stars out there, you have this uh, this giant field with hundreds or thousands of stars in there. Can any of these planets have can any of these stars have exoplanets around them? You can't just look. If you look at a, if you look at a star and you magnify it, you know. It'd be nice if you could just look at, the, look at the planet, look at the star, and see if there's planets around it. But if you look at that star, and you zoom in on it, the star is so bright compared to the brightness of the planets. It's like, you know, if you have a lorry, that's, if it's the middle of the night, and there's a lorry driving at you, and there's a little bug, a little mosquito, which is, you know, flying around the headlights of that lorry, and it's coming right at you. Um, it's impossible to see that little bug because you're blinded by the brightness of the headlights, right? Same thing happens when you're looking for exoplanets, although it's, it turns out that these planets are millions of times fainter even than that bug in the headlights. So if you look at these, if you look at these stars, you just get blinded by the brightness of the star. You can't see the planets. So direct imaging is what we call it. It's basically just uh, a non-starter. It doesn't work at all for searching for these planets. But there's a little trick. There's a couple other little tricks that we can use. One of them is called transits. And uh, this is where, if we're looking for a... Uh, a uh, we have a star here, and a planet orbiting the star. Let's look at the total, the total amount of light that we see coming from the star. Um, uh, if a planet is orbiting the star over here, if it's off to the side, then we can see the star. But occasionally, that planet passes in front of the star, and it blocks out the light from the star. And when it blocks out the light from the star, the star gets dimmer. And if the, like, Jupiter goes in front of the, the sun, and you, if you were an alien, on Alpha Centauri, looking back at Jupiter, you would see the sun get dimmer about every five years as Jupiter went in front of it. <coughs> about every ten years. And, um, and the same thing, you would see if you were looking at it, you would see the sun get a little bit dimmer every one year when the Earth went in front of the sun, if you were lined up properly. And so this is, this is an indirect measurement. You're not actually seeing it, you're not taking a picture of the planet, but you're detecting the planet by its effect on the star itself. And so this is actual data here. This is a, this is a plot of some, of some observations that have been done of a, uh, of a star. And during this, what's called a transit search, where you just, you, it's a very boring job for a telescope. Um, and you just take a telescope and you have it, you park it on the same star for weeks and weeks or months and months. And you look for brightnesses, for you, and you look for little dips in the star of brightness. And if you see a little dip, it goes like this, and it drops, and then it comes back up, and then later it drops. Comes back up. It does look the same. You could infer there must be a planet here. And the time from here to here is the time it takes for the planet to go around one time. That's a year on that planet. And then this distance here, this relates to how big the star and how big the planet is. Like a really big planet like this one will cause a really wide dip. And the width here also relates to how fast it's moving. It's moving really quickly or really slowly. And that tells you about how close the star is. Uh, from how close it is, you can actually guess its temperature. And so, if you can guess its temperature, and you can guess, and you know the temperature of the star, because it's pretty easy to measure the temperature of the star, you can just take its, its spectrum, its color. 
Um, then you can determine the, the temperature range for a planet. You can tell if this, if this planet that you've discovered is really close to its star, in which case it's going to cook off the water and just boil it away. I mean, it's thousands of degrees. Or you can tell if the planet is too far away from its star, so it's frozen. Or you can tell if the planet is in this, what we call a habitable zone, which is the region where liquid water would be supported. And again, we don't want to be biased just by looking for liquid water. But liquid water is by far the most common liquid in the solar system or in the universe. And uh, so it's a good place to start, even though there might be other liquids that we want to look for later as well. So um, about a year ago, uh, there were, there were uh, exciting results from this telescope called TRAPPIST. Uh, TRAPPIST is a, is a search program run in Belgium. Um, it's, a, it's an acronym here. I think it also is a kind of beer, I guess, because the, the, the um, Belgium, they really like beverages of that territory. That, uh, um, and so this, this uh, planet's telescope is just staring at, these, at this field of stars. And it detected this one star that they called TRAPPIST-1, because it was on their uh, first one they discovered. About 39 light years from Earth. 39 light years, that sounds like a long way from the Earth. It's actually, in the scheme of things, it's not very far. Uh, the light, the, keep in mind, the universe is billions, about 15 billion years, light years away, uh, light years across. And so 39 light years away is pretty close to this in the relevant. This is the sort of star that you can see with your naked eye. It's, it's relatively close. And uh, so this is initially, um, in 2016, they had, uh, uh, they saw something that was interesting with this star. And then they followed up using a bunch of other telescopes, including the two-meter Himalayan Chandra telescope, which is uh, this is up in Ladakh, and this is uh, just about the highest telescope um, uh, in the world uh, in terms of, in terms of elevation. It's a great telescope with a great sight um, uh, that really contributed in, in a big way to these observations. And so uh, this is the this is the plot that um, that uh, they found for the star, and. Um, um, this is this, so. This is what this is showing is the brightness of the star versus time. So this is in this is in days. So this is a day, another day, another day, another day, and uh, and this brightness here. Uh, uh, so here you have a dip here, and that means there's a planet in front of the star right here. And here's another dip here, so there's a planet in front of the star, another planet, another planet. And in most most times when we detect exoplanets, in fact, in every other case beforehand. These things were spaced really regularly, just like railroad tracks, like every day or every month or whatever. And you'd have a dip, just like this, going periodically across. But you can stare at this as long as you want, and there's no simple periodicity. It's not like this, these planets look like they're coming and going in completely random shapes. And so, uh, so this is really confusing for quite some time. And eventually what they figured out, there's not one planet there. There's not two planets there. There's not three planets there. There's seven different planets, and they're all orbiting in the sun. They're all lined up, so they're all blocking out the star at different times. And each of these planets have a different size, and a different speed, and a different position in its orbit, and so forth. And so when you put all these seven planets together, you get this crazy um, variation in the brightness of the star. So this is really interesting to, um, to have a planet with seven stars. But what's most fascinating is that these planets also all of them are very close to the habitable zone. So here's a, here's a map of this, of this uh, planetary system. So this is the star at the center. And here's the first planet, second planet, third planet, fourth planet, fifth planet, and so forth. And, um, and this gray area is the area where liquid water could survive on the surface. If you're at the, too close to the star, then liquid water is just going to boil off. Like you're, this, this is kind of like if you're on Mercury. And if you're too far out here, like if you're on Pluto, it's going to be too cold. But if liquid water is there, then that raises the possibility that this might be a good place to look for life. So this is very similar to our solar system. Here we have the Trappist system up here with its seven planets. And these are not, these are not photos, right? These are, these are just an artist's guess at what the planet might look like. But the, but the size and the position of the planet is correct. And so here it is compared to our solar system. So these, solar, these planets are a little bit bigger than ours, um, and there's more of them. But it basically lines up in the same place as the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, in our solar system. Um, so, we can't go visit these planets that are too far away. We can't even take pictures of these planets, because they're too far away for that. But, we can do a lot of studies with telescopes to measure their orbits, and to measure, perhaps, measure their spectrum, perhaps measure their color a little bit, to see some of their chemical composition. 
Um, we can simulate uh, how different processes are happening on these planets. Like, you know, do the planets, or how close do these planets come to each other? Could life transfer from one planet to another planet? Um, can we find out anything about their atmospheres, their other composition, and so forth? And so, um, this is maybe the most exciting new discovery in terms of looking for life well, well, well beyond our solar system in the last decades. So, astrobiology is this, is this very broad field. It involves biology and chemistry and physics and astronomy and computations and, uh, and everything coming together. Um, and so there's so much interest in, and, and I think it's answering so much of some of these uh, fundamental important questions about life on Earth, how we are here, how we got here, and, uh, and whether we're alone. So thank you so much. We flew it into the atmosphere of Saturn, 
were entirely burned up in the atmosphere of Saturn. And so any bacteria which were on it would have been cooked in the, uh, in the flames as we went down in Saturn's atmosphere. So it's, it's gone now. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an exciting mission, and it's kind of, a, kind of an exciting way to end it, too. Excuse me. So we are uh, searching for water instead of searching for life, actually. Yeah. So uh, is it not that we are living in a part of the universe where uh, water is very much necessary for life? But is there any other form of life? Uh, maybe we will, we will have a thought, ex thought, ex I mean, a thought experiment where uh, life can exist even without water. Is it that possible? Absolutely. It's absolutely possible. Um, we don't know that. We, we, it, you know, chemistry happens fastest in liquids. And life is really complex. And so, so in order to support the most complex chemistry, you probably want a liquid rather than a gas or a solid. And water is probably the most common liquid in, this, in the universe. Because hydrogen and oxygen are the most common volatile elements. And so it's a good guess to start with Saturn, to start with water. But there are plenty of other liquids which might be possible as well. So, so we should search for those too. You bet. <coughs>